recording this webinar. And here we go. Gitan, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Gitan. And for those of you who don't know me, I am the founder and creator of Vitamin Framework and Trauma Key System. And uh, I'm, I'm right now in Bali. It's, uh, it's 10 o'clock in the can yeah. you hear me better now? Now we can, yes. Okay, so let me just hold the mic next to my mouth then when I'm speaking. Okay. Is it is it better? Everyone can hear me better? Yes, it's better. Um, go ahead and repeat what you said, though, because we couldn't quite hear what you said earlier. Okay, so my name is Gitan. I am a creator and developer of Biodynamic Breathwork and Trauma Release System. And uh, I am teaching this all around the world. And in, at the moment, I am in Bali. And it's, uh, it's in the evening, late here. And, but I'm very happy to be here on this webinar together with Prema. Yeah, and my name is Prema. Um, I live in Vancouver. And right now, I'm actually in Minnesota. Uh, not as, not as um, special as Bali, <laughs> but it's where I am. And uh, I'm a biodynamic breath and trauma release therapist. I'm also a somatic experiencing therapist. And I lead BBTR groups uh, around the world. And we're really excited about today's webinar. It's about understanding character structure. And character structure is something that we teach in the BBTRS system, in the Biodynamic Breath and Trauma Release School. We teach uh, character structure and how to work with character structure, and we found that it's a really, really important information for people to understand themselves better, to get to know their patterns and how they came about through childhood experiences. And it's also really important if we work with other people because it gives us great insight into what is happening with our clients, what they may be experiencing, and how we can best help them. So we're going to cover this information a bit today. It's taught much more in depth in the, in the training program. Uh, so we have webinars. And at the end, we're also going to talk about a special group that we're going to have in Poland in May that's specifically about how we work to heal some of the underlying trauma that has produced these character structures. So let's go ahead and get started. In the beginning, so this work actually evolves out of the work of this man. Um, this is uh, Dr. Wilhelm Reich. He was a student of Freud's and he was very highly trained. He was a protege actually in his 20s. He was already trained by Freud and he was one of, he was almost like Freud's son. He was really the heir apparent to Freud's work. And he wrote many, many books and articles and was a deep thinker and a researcher in the field of um, early psychology. But he noticed that with all the work that was being done with people in psychoanalysis, where they'd go for sessions every day for years after years after years, that not much change for his clients. So he really started to look at what else is going on here. And that led to his groundbreaking book, Character Analysis. Um, and he started to look at the body and he started to see there was patterns in our body um, and patterns and the way people were repeatedly showing up in life and, and doing things, the way they would relate to other people or the way they would avoid conflict or the way they would try to keep the relationships going and keep making the same mistakes over and over again. So he started to look at what is the actual patterns that we develop and why do we develop them? Why do we have these patterns that don't work very well in life? that cause quite a bit of suffering for people, enough suffering that they're going into psychoanalysis every day for years, but things are not getting better. So he started to look at what is possibly going on here. And he started to relate it back to issues in childhood, how we were raised, what kinds of traumas we experienced, what kind of stressors or disruptions were happening in childhood. So what we see now is that when there are disruptions in our childhood, the child has very limited ways of dealing with disruptions, with stress, with trauma. Obviously, a child is so small, they can't you know, run away and take care of themselves. And they can't really fight back against their caretaker because they're completely dependent upon them for everything they have. And so what they do is they form certain ways of disconnecting. So what they'll do is actually can either disconnect from part of themselves, um, they'll hold back parts of themselves or give up parts of themselves in order to stay in the family relationship, in order to try and get some sort of 
love, support, connection, belonging, sense of belonging from the family system. Um, and one way that children do that and that we learn to do that is by freezing our energy in parts of our body. And that keeps us stuck in periods of time in the past. Um, and this way of, of freezing energy in the body and forming these patterns of blockages is one of the things we work with a lot in BBTRS. Yitan, would you like to speak a little bit about that? Yes, this is precisely what we address at BBTRS. We work with this energetic distribution which takes, which takes the form of uh, tension inside the body and this tension is distributed in different areas according to all of these different types. And this is precisely what we address in uh, biodynamic breathwork and trauma pieces. It's great that you mentioned how this, this forms. Yeah, and each, each, we're going to go over this briefly here, but each structure actually freezes the energy differently in their body based on the time in the life that the trauma occurred. Um, obviously, when you're very, very young, you have very few resources, um, very few, very little ability to manage any sort of experience. The nervous system is even fully formed. So that type of freezing changes from when they're a little bit older, a little bit older, a little bit older, and, and we're going to go over that in just a minute. And I just love this quote from Dr. Gabor Mate. Um, he's an, he's, a, he's a, an amazing, amazing physician. Um, wonderful talks on YouTube. You can pull them up. But he just says it so simply here. He says people, and that, that obviously would include babies and children. We have two needs. We have the need to attach, and we have the need to be authentic. And when being authentic, meaning being ourselves, if being who we truly are threatens the relationship with our parents, with our attachment system, that the attachment system, the um, attachment system will trump authenticity, meaning we will give up who we are. We will give up parts of ourselves in order to stay attached, in order to keep belonging to the system that we're in, no matter how traumatizing it is. And uh, actually, this is exactly what comes up a lot when we work with biodynamic breathwork in, in sessions, is people surrender their way of being just as they could receive love. And this actually affects their physical body tremendously. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very vivid how, how this affects the way that they carry themselves physically. Yeah, we're going to show you some diagrams here in just a minute that demonstrates that really well. And again, if you have any questions as we're going through this, feel free to write them in the chat box. So how is character actually formed in the body? We're, you know, we're not psychoanalysis. We're not dealing with this primarily through talking with people and working with levels of meaning and understanding. We're looking at what's actually happening right here, right now in our clients' bodies, in our own bodies, that are keeping these stuck patterns, these frozen patterns in place. So as we're developing as children, we learn how to inhibit, how to hold back our feelings through chronic patterns of tension and tightening in our body. If you think of a, of a, like a three or four year old or five year old, if you've had much experience with that age group, if something happens and they're about to be upset and to cry, and, and if their mom says, don't you cry, what, how does a child stop themselves by crying? They stop their breathing. They get really tight in their jaw and their throat and their belly. They learn, okay, if I constrict down my body, I can constrict down my feelings. As adults, one of the ways that we try to hold in stress and anger is we contract our shoulder muscles. How many of us have tight neck and shoulders or get, they get tight whenever we get an email from our boss that stresses us out or something makes us angry? We're able to tighten these muscles to hold back anger. Deep fear. Um, is contracts our core energy at the very at their very center our energy gets sucked up into our head and we contract our core and squeeze everything in real tight to get real small and all this is to stop us from feeling our feelings Gitan, would you like to say anything about this it actually this is the reason why we start to work with the body by working with the belts of tension and uh, all of these uh, constrictions that you just talked about, uh, Grandma, they are, they are distributed in the, in the belts of tensions around the body. And this is how Reich described them. So we are working with the oral, with the cervical, with the thoracic, with the diaphragmatic, abdominal, and pelvic belts. And we are precisely addressing these uh, particular uh, tensions that, that 
just talking about the jaw, the belly, the throat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and working the, these belts of tension Kiten is mentioning there, they roughly correspond with the levels of the chakras, but there's very specific techniques for how to release each of those belts in breathwork sessions through touch and other ways. And that's one of the things that we, that's taught in the BBTR training. Um, and that's to help free up each level of constriction, which allows the full energy to start to move through the body. And when that happens, people regain access to their feelings. They regain access to their sensuality. They regain access to like the deeper understanding really of who they are and, and what they really want in life. Yes, so, and another thing that you just mentioned is uh, that uh, a lot of the constriction is, resides in the core in the body. And just to get to the core, we have to get through many, many layers of, of superficial restriction. And the core, that, like you said, it stores the fear. And the fear of actually being yourself. And if I am myself, I am not accepted. Therefore, I will be tracked. So yeah. mainly the core tension that is stored is it's there because of the development of trauma. Yeah, yeah. And so in essence, these character types that we're going we're gonna to dive into now, they really are survival strategies. They're very smart. They're defenses that were got put in place when we were children to help us manage a really difficult situation. And you can't get more difficult than not being able to be who you really are and having to mold and bend and shape yourself in various ways um, in order to try and feel like you fit in or that you can have love for, from the system or to even be safe in the, in the family system sometimes. So they're really survival strategies. Um, and they show up in our bodies and they show up as tension like we were talking about. And they also show up as areas of weakness as well and disconnection. Um, one of the things that we'll be going over in the training that we're going to have in Poland is how to actually build up body resources, how to actually return to the body and teach the body what it needs to know at that time when it was developing but didn't get that resource. That's going to show up as an area of weakness in the body. Um, and the, the character also shows how we learn to compensate for the disconnection from our, from our needs and from our life force energy. And like I said, these were brilliant, really important strategies to employ when we were children, but now they're limiting as adults. The analogy I always use is it's kind of like when we were five years old or three years old or two years old, we put on a coat of armor to protect ourselves, but we've grown up since then. And, it's, and we have more resources in our life now that we didn't have then. We have so much more available to us and we've learned so much more. And so we don't need to keep on that old coat of armor and we can actually remove that safely and gently um, and move into a different uh, way of being with ourselves in the world. Um, I'm hearing uh, some people. Yes, did, does everyone hear me now? Can you yes. type in the box if that's okay? Because uh, the doors, somebody was saying that they, they are. Yes, oh, okay, good. So great. I will really keep the mic next to my mouth. Okay, okay good. Thanks, Gita. Yeah, go on, go on, Rema. Okay. It's okay. Okay. So what happened was um, Reich started to see that there's these different patterns and he had certain names from for them. But then his student Alexander Lowen came in and Alexander Lowen really systematized this and, and made it much more uh, into patterns that we could easily identify with body shapes and different muscles of tension. He created a system called bioenergetics, which was extremely popular in the 70s and 80s. And, and so he, he identified these five core um, character types, the schizoid, the oral, psychopathic, masochist, and rigid. And Reich was a medical doctor. Lowen was a medical doctor. It's a very pathologizing names, and I really dislike these names. And um, so I'm putting also here different names that kind of address uh, kind of the core issue of each type, the connection, need, will, autonomy, love, sexuality, um, that are much less pathologizing because we don't need to use this. this we, we use the name so you can read other material and know what we're talking about. But the system is not about pathologizing someone and like, oh, that's a psychopathic person or, oh, they're just a masochist. That's really, um, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, actually, the, we use them in the training, so it's easier to identify. But the, you know, the names could be to some people could be actually the names themselves could be very confronting. 
and yeah. uh, it, but it, it's that's there's just the reality of it. And uh, I actually like the names that you chose: the connection, the autonomy, will, and love sexuality. So it's uh, it's great. Yeah, yeah, because the schizoid, you'll see the core issue for the schizoid is the need to connect. For the oral, it's the need, it's to be able to recognize their needs. For the psychopathic character, it's, it's to realize their own autonomy. Um, for the masochist person, it's to have a healthy relationship to their will and their willpower. And for the rigid, a big part of the issue is around a healthy relationship to their love and sexuality. So these character structures really develop by about the age seven. That's what Lowen finally in the end um, is, is stating. And, and there's actually been further research done on this. And we're going to be covering the latest research in character structure formation and, and how to work with it in the Poland uh, class that we're going to be having. But um, these, these character structures, they're pretty much in place by about age seven. And they, they are focused in on at each age group, there is a particular core need or capacity that had to be developed and supported in the family system. And if that wasn't supported, if that wasn't able to be developed both in the psychology and in the child's body, there's these disrupt these, the, this, disruptions and then the character structure forms as a way to adapt and compensate and, and try to deal with that disruption. So again, the connection to our body and others, which is also the right to be here, um, that's the schizoid. The, the oral is the attunement to our needs and the right to have them met uh, for this psychopathic to be able to trust and have healthy interdependence with people. For the masochist structure, it's the autonomy, the right to our authentic expression and healthy willpower. And then for the rigid, it's around love and sexuality. And that's the right to be loved for who we are without needing to be perfect. Uh, the rigid character structure really has this um, deeply held belief and fear that if they're not perfect, they don't have value and they will never be loved. So the first structure, the schizoid structure, this, is, um, this structure can start to form in the, when you're still in the womb or in the first few months of life. You know, ideally when we're developing in our mother's womb, we want to have this sense of being really welcomed into the world, that we're wanted. And children get at a bodily level if they're wanted or not. They can feel the signals coming through the mother's body, the hormones, uh, food she's eating, any tensions that might be in, her, in the body and in the womb. And the children, the, the developing embryo really gets a sense of, is this a safe place or not? Am I welcomed? Am I, am I really a part of here? And if there's a disruption of that, if there's a disconnection, then this um, structure can really can start to develop. And it develops as a result of there's this early shock or attachment trauma, meaning that the child gets a sense that I'm not welcomed here. Things are not safe. And it could be something like, you know, maybe something happened in the mother's life and she was really stressed about, you know, something at work or something in her family. But those stress hormones send, send the signal to the child that they're not, that this is not a safe place. Or it could have been a really painful or difficult delivery, birth trauma, or maybe the mother had postpartum depression or there was a medical issue and the child and the mother were separated around the time of birth in those first few months. It could be things that have nothing actually to do with what the mother feels towards her child. She could be feeling lots of love, but there could be this disconnection and the sense that the world is not safe and welcoming. And so the child, what does the child have to do? They disconnect from their body. The body is a very painful place to be in at this point if they don't feel safe. So they disconnect from their body and their feelings and they move into living in their minds. Yeah, they usually, uh, the, the, the kind of type of uh, schizoid structure, they look for safety in other realms. So they go into meditation, they go into psychic experiences. So it's very difficult for them. The body is not a safe place. And, and uh, the way that we work with this kind of character is, is step by step getting them come back into their physical body so they can feel at home in their physical bodies. Yeah, and so one of the some of the common themes that we'll see for someone with this structure is underlying there can be a lot of shame at even existing. They feel like a burden. They have a feeling like they don't belong. Like so many times I have schizoid clients who say things like, I feel like I'm an alien on this planet, or I feel like I belong somewhere else, or 
I have one client who I love to death. I absolutely love her. And in our sessions, she's telling me about some other galactic something or other that she somehow has a connection to. And it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I get it. And, and that's very much this feeling of not belonging here and belonging that they actually have a home elsewhere. And so they often, as a way to adapt to this, what, we, what we'll see on the outside oftentimes in our clients or in people that we know or people we might be in a relationship with is that there could be a lot of pride in being a loner or they don't need other people or they're not emotional. Um, like Eten just said, they're, you know, they, they go into a lot into meditation and things like that as a way to not connect to other people and not to be so much here. Oh, okay. Would you like to say something, Gitan? Um, yes, actually. Um, you were talking a little bit about Moen before. And Moen put forward this uh, structure, you called it the formation for personality structure. And at the core of this structure is the heart. So heart is our deepest core. And there's a, always a ingrained desire to reach out and be met at this reaching out. And all of these layers that kind of envelop the heart, which is the muscular layer, the emotional layer, and the most superficial layer is the layer of ego. So when the heart at, at the very core, the heart is being uh, ignored with, for its desire to reach out and connect, this, this creates a very, um, uh, very tangible physical appearance and physical structure. And this is what the, um, the schizoid structure you talked about, the, the heart wants to connect, but, but the body is almost non-existent for this person. Yeah. Yeah, you can see in the diagram there, it's often a very tall, thin, very contracted into their core type of body, and the eyes often have kind of a vacant look to them. Um, there's a lot of blockage around the eyes areas, and um, yeah, great. Anything else you want to say about this type, Gitan? No. no. Okay. So we'll move on. Now, I, I'm just going to touch into this real briefly because I think it's important for everyone to know. This, is, this structure has the earliest form of trauma. And this trauma came about before the nervous system was fully formed. And it's very common in this structure for them to have sort of nervous system syndromal issues, health issues as adults. And it can show up with things like migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue, environmental sensitivities, depression, fibromyalgia, digestive problems that don't make sense to anybody. Um, and that's, these are patterns of nervous system dysregulation because a lot of that trauma and fear from the earliest times is still held in that system. We talked about that the core being contracted earlier with fear. That is still going on. Even though the trauma was at birth or earlier around that time, as adults, it still impacts them. And so this is, um, this is one of the other telltale signs that somebody may be dealing with very, very early trauma. They show up with any of these types of health issues. Yeah, it's actually in biodynamic breath work, we encounter a lot of the people that have to go through a training, a one-week training uh, through experiential force. They say that these conditions that you just named start to improve. And that's also because we can we connect them very deeply with their physical body and this constriction, this restriction that's been held deep at the core for this type of person starts to release. Yeah. So it improves general health. Yeah. Cool. So um, Gitan, I love what you're saying. Make sure the mic is really right up next to your mouth when yeah, because that will help a lot. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the next period in life. This is the oral structure, um, also known as the needy child. And this can, any disruptions in the first, they say about 18 months of life can produce this type of adaptation. And what the core issue here is, is that when, we're, when we come into this world, we actually don't know what our body is signaling to us. The child doesn't know that they're hungry. They feel uncomfortable, and so they cry. And through, they feel uncomfortable, they cry, they get fed, we start to learn that it's actually hunger, or we learn it's a wet diaper, or we learn that it's loneliness, or we learn that, okay, I'm overstimulated. We just know there's pain and discomfort. And then we start to learn in this age of our life that relationships with others, we start to learn something really important called 
recognizing our basic needs, um, sleep, food, contact, things like this, um, that we start to learn that others can either be a source of safety for us and a way to get our basic needs met, or they may not be attuned to us and they may not be able to help us. So the child starts to understand and sense what is satisfaction to them, what is what helps them feel satiated. Um, they start to get a sense that they've gotten enough of what they actually need so they can go on to do something else. They've gotten enough food, they've gotten enough hugs, they've gotten enough, um, they've got their diaper changed, whatever it may be. And so now they can start to go on and, 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 and you know, explore the world or play with their toy or whatever. They start to get a felt sense of what it is to have their needs met. And this is really, really important because this is when we start to get connected to what our needs are and to whether we actually have the right to have our needs and if we have the right to expect our needs to be met or not. And if there's disruptions during this time, um, if the, for reasons that the parents are not attuned to the child, maybe there's, um, for some reason, long separations, there may be emotional disconnection, whatever it may be, that attunement to their needs isn't, isn't happening. And so the child doesn't get the sense that their needs can actually ever really be met. And so they start to disconnect from their needs. And, they, and our needs are basic to who we are as people. They're basic to our body and being able to live in our body. Um, they're basic to be able to feel like we can trust others to actually be there for us. And so they start to disconnect from themselves and they get overly focused then on the others because they, they don't learn that they can meet their own needs and they can regulate themselves but they start to really get anxious and always be focused on, can this other person out there possibly meet my needs? This may sound familiar to some of us. <laughs> you done? Many. Yes. <laughs> yes, actually. And, and when we work with, with people uh, with, the, with the oral structure, the needy child type in, in the biodynamic breath work, what we do a lot is we ask them to reach out in the session so they can actually reach out and experience that their reaching out has been met physically. And this, this sometimes I see time and time again that this creates a, a huge opening for, for a person who belongs to this structure. And actually, uh, we, we put these structures forward, but uh, none of us is, is just one. We collect many of them, and there's usually one or two that are predominant, but most of us have, have all of them in us. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, when the person reaches out and they have their, this, this actual reaching out met, uh, it's, it's just it's, it's a very huge heart opening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You really get the felt sense that somebody can be there for you and you can have your needs met. And when that happens, something very, very deep inside gets to finally relax. Something that has been waiting their whole life perhaps to, to feel relaxed and to feel met and seen gets to happen. And that is life changing. So this structure, um, Underlying it, there's really a lot of shame around their needs. And there's a sense of un being unfulfilled or empty and undeserving. And so way that we compensate for that, how we appear on the outside so we don't have to feel all this stuff inside, is we often become caretakers. These people make great therapists. They're often the therapists in the world who are taking care of everyone else. Um, they take pride in being the shoulder that everyone else can cry on and they make themselves indispensable and needed. If I, if everyone else needs me, then somehow I will in the end eventually get my needs met. Um, and they also, or they can go on the becoming, other side. Becoming great artists and, 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 uh, and uh, actors because they want attention. Yes, yes. And they can also flip to the other side and take this great pride. And I don't need anything. I can do it all myself. I'll, I don't need anybody. Um, if I ever actually did need anybody, I'll just, I'll just be disappointed. And so therefore, I'm not going to need anything. 
So it can run the whole gamut. And, and, you know, you can imagine what it's, how hard that is to live in life and how hard it is to be in relationship to somebody like that as well. <laughs> Becoming anti-dependent. Yes, anti-dependent. Um, so let's move on now to the next part, the psychopathic structure. Now, this is, there's a wide age range here, you know, eight months to four years. That's, that's a big range of time. And during this time, there's like this huge explosion of energy. Um, you know, the child starts to explore the world. There's, they're curious. There's a lot of like wanting to find out what's this and what's this and that everything is exciting and fascinating. You know, everything is new. Um, during this time as well, the child starts to take those few first few steps away from their caretakers. They start to have more of an impulse to be independent and, and not so dependent on their caretakers. Um, they, and it's important for the child at this time to know that they can go out and, and go out into the world or, you know, the next room in the house and start to look for what they want. And they can also come back and get nourishment and, and support and reassurance from their parents. So there's this pulsation that starts to develop, you know, of going out into the world and then being able to return to a safe place and going out into the world and being able to return to safety. Um, so they, this is the first time um, they can start to reach out and grab things and take them into themselves and also can let go of things. The vocabulary is growing like crazy. Um, they can start to name their feelings and objects and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, and unfortunately, manipulation can start to come in at this time because this is a big ball of energy and, and parents being what they are oftentimes can't really support it. And so um, they might start taking the child's toys away which is pretty cruel because to a child of this age, that toy is really highly significant and meaningful. And then as a, as a form of punishment, the parents are coming in and taking away this really important object and taking it away from them. Um, you know, the parents might, you know, my child might be wanting to do one thing and the parent instead is like, no, go look over there, do this, try and take away their attention. Um, they could, there's so many different ways that parents unknowingly can start to manipulate the child and what they want. And so the child starts to um, get a sense that things can be used against them. Um, and those other forms of manipulation, even more overtly in the family can start to develop where the child gets a sense that they can't really be who they want to be, that if they are who they really are, that the parents are not going to like it or they are getting signals that they need to be something else. Um, and so they, they start to develop, create a false self, self of themselves and uh, to deal with this manipulation of the parents and to try and get a sense that they're actually okay. Dan, anything you want to add to this one? Yeah, so structurally what you see with the psychopathic character is that the split in the physical body happens around the waist or around the diaphragm. So it, there's a lot of energy that moves up and the lower part of the body becomes undercharged. So there's literally not so much connection with the earth and the ground. And the, the, by learning the manipulation, these uh, psychopathic characters have a pretty strong mind. There's also manipulation and sexual seduction that, that are, are part of the strategy of this character. So if we work with psychopathic character, we uh, we try to bring the energy down from from the uh, overcharged upper body into the lower body. So really, actually create this bridge, reestablish this bridge between the upper and the lower part. Yeah, there's a big fear for the structure on being vulnerable because there were so many early experiences that their feelings were used against them, or that they couldn't be vulnerable, or if they were vulnerable and they really gave from their heart that. Um, that they got hurt. It wasn't respected in their family system. And so like the Gita was saying how the energy, there's a cutoff at the waist and there's all this energy up. And you can see in this picture here, there's all this energy up around the heart area to protect it. There's a lot of armoring and holding there. So wanting to connect that and help the energy come back down to the earth and connect down. And so um, I'm, not, I'm trying to understand what that note, there's a sound under in the background. Ken, can you take the microphone away for a moment and see if that's your breathing that we're hearing? Oh, sorry, everyone. Let me just check real quick. 
Let's see if there's anybody that's unmuted that I need to mute out. No, everyone's muted. Okay, maybe it will pass. Okay, so underneath this character structure, there's a feeling of being small, powerless, used, and betrayed. And so what you do to compensate in the world is you try to become really successful and powerful and strong, and you use or betray others as a way to prevent yourself from being hurt. Uh, Kitan, why don't you bring the mic back up to your mouth and let's see what happens. Yeah, anything you want to add here? Um, no, actually, you, you can continue going on. This is, this is really great. And uh, I, I, I feel that uh, what I will add is something about uh, related to the physical body. So for okay. now, let's go on. With the okay. Process. Okay. So we're going to go on to the next structure, the masochist structure, also known as the endurer. And this happens around the age of two and a half to four years old, where there's a lot of energy and strength coming into their bodies at this age. Um, children at this age, you know, they love to take objects and just run across the room with them and, or run into other things. And they like to move furniture around. Um, they're like little machines, little power machines, and they, and they love to assert their energy and use their power to make stuff happen. And, um, and in this age group, if they learn that if they make a mistake, if they grow up in a family where shame is used a lot, um, and they're not taught that it's okay to make mistakes, that, you know, uh, it doesn't make them a bad person. You know, parents need to affirm their child's intention, even if the results don't turn out exactly the way they want it. Let's say the child draws a picture of a dog, and the dog has two legs. And if the family says, well, no, dogs are, your dog are missing legs. Dogs have four legs. That's, that's subtly shaming to the child. They need to, children this age need to grow up and learn that they can make mistakes, that it's okay, and that get blamed or criticized for their mistakes. Um, also, a lot of times in this age group, there can be um, messages from the parents. Of, they can be very controlling. The parents can dictate what the child wears, when they eat, what they play, what they're allowed to do, and not give much freedom of, of choice for the child and let them really flourish in this new energy in their body that wants to be able to go and explore and follow their impulses and, and do what they want to do. Um, this is a chat coming in. You think Guna's mic is on. Let me just check again. Okay. Guna? Guna, if you can hear us, can you see if you, can you mute yourself out? That might be the source of the noise that's happening. I cannot, I actually cannot see. Okay, that, okay, well, we'll see what happens. Okay, so, so they were not allowed to really separate and be their own individual person and form their own unique identity. The parents were often very controlling in, the, in this type of environment. And so to cope with this, they tend to, you know, and, and children get frustrated and angry at this age, and it's a natural expression. And parents oftentimes don't like it when their children get angry and they punish them or something like that. And so they learn to hold in their anger and they learn to become very compliant and be like the good child in order to try and stay in the family system. Like again, that authenticity, um, you know, fall, tr attachment will trump authenticity. Will the need to attach and be with the family system will, will trump their need to be able to express their anger or to express their resentment or whatever it might be. And that, no, I don't want to do this, what the family is doing. So they learn so to actually, suppress all that. Yeah, actually, because of they're not allowed to express what they feel, they start to grow in size. It's like a balloon that's being pumped and pumped and pumped. And it's not allowed to, to release anything. Physical body starts to grow. It actually makes the core weak, but all of the energy is, is uh, focused on the periphery of the body and distributed pretty evenly. So the person is, is kind of could be chubby, overweight, just because they're not allowed, they're not comfortable as expressing their emotion, their, their emotional expression. Yeah. And so underneath, uh, inside, there's a lot of held in anger. And they could also be very resentful of authority and, and, and secretly rebellious um, and enjoy irritating other people. 
And that's not what's, that can be what's, that's all the energy that's kind of trapped inside. But on the outside, they come across as very nice and sweet and compliant. They're the good person, the helpful person. And they really don't want to disappoint others because if they disappoint others, then a big load of shame can come up for them again. So moving on, I'm not sure what, you know, let me try one thing real quick. I'm going to mute you out real quick. I'm going to see if the noise goes away. Okay, it is. Okay, so Gitan, for some reason, why don't you try taking your mic off? Because for some reason, Gitan, the noise is actually coming from, from your mic. Okay, and let's have you just speak through there. Okay, so now moving on to the rigid structure. So this is around the age of three to seven. This is a, a beautiful time where the child is really starting to become aware of their bodies and their sensuality in a healthy way. Um, they can be very loving and affectionate, and there's no split in them between love and sexuality. Um, they have lots of fantasy role play. I'm going to be a princess. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a soldier, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and so th there's there's a beautiful wholeness to their body and their being and they can, and they can play and, and have fun and, and just be really creative. And their body is starting to make lots of changes during this time. And often there can be this thing where the child will start to attach to the parent of the opposite gender. Girls want to really be daddy's little girl or boys really want to be mommy's little man. And there can be like these, these kind of like this love energy that starts to develop but that can often get feel uncomfortable to the parents or get rejected or the child can perceive it as a feeling of being rejected. Um, and they start to feel like they're wrong or, or their own sexuality or feelings of love and affection are, are wrong. And, and if they were just better enough, if they were good enough, if they were a little bit more perfect, if they were a little bit more smarter or whatever, they can, um, they'll, be, they'll be good enough to have their parents' love. Um, and if they can just be a little bit more than what they are. And so this whole split starts to develop between their sexuality, their heart, and also this feeling that I need to be something better and more perfect than who I am. Yes, and you could really see, is everyone can hear me? Okay yeah, now? get as close to your, mic, your computer microphone as possible. So it, you could really see this in the physical body. The physical body is actually very proportionate, but, uh, but it, it, the, the whole muscular structure is hard. So they hold a lot of the tension on the periphery of the body. And again, the core is weak, and this type of person has a lot of problems with their spine. But what we try to do is to, to support them to to start to become sensitive, to start to drop this superficial armory when we work with biodynamic breath work with, uh, with the rigid structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, inside, there's a lot of hurt and feelings of rejection, feeling they're not good enough, that they're unloved and actually unlovable. Um, that's kind of, that's, that's a lot of the energy that's held inside, a lot of the emotional energy that's there. And so how they compensate on the world for that is they often are the ones who reject other people first. And they need to be this perfect person. They're the, the high, high, high overachiever type A personalities. Don't allow for mistakes. Um, and they really seem like they have everything together. And they have a lot of energy invested in having everything together. So why do we want to know this? Why is this so important for us? Well, it can, re it can really tell us a lot about what somebody is experiencing in the world and how they can limit the, how they're limiting themselves or causing themselves unnecessary suffering, because what they're most wanting, um, those type of like when Gintem was talking earlier about the oral character and teaching them that they can reach out, what they are most longing for in the world, the armoring, the patterns they have in place actually prevents them from even being able to feel or recognize that it's available. This uh, this the love that they want. Um, the connection that they want may be fully available, but the armoring prevents them from being able to see it or feel it or be able to take it in. And so um, when working with the structures and working on our own healing work, we want to be able to facilitate the, 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 the having that missing experience. Um, 
working with ways to help the body gently bring down the armor, gently bring down these patterns of protection. And so the, own, the person's own healing energy can come forth and they can actually receive what is being offered here and what's available to them. And they can also build in their own body the resources necessary so they don't have to be in this pattern anymore, releasing this, the fear, the grief, the sadness, um, the shame, whatever it may be that's being held inside. And this actually de-armoring that we go through which in biodynamic breath work, it supports the people to move from the personality which is acquired. It's a shell for them to feel safe. The personality, the muscular tension is acquired to prevent the spontaneous release. Uh, so they move from this personality to individuality, which is something ingrained, something their, their true nature. So the energy of the heart can reach through all of the, the layers that are enveloping it, the, the muscular layer, the emotional layer, and, uh, and reach to the periphery, which is the ego. So the energy of the heart will affect the ego and personality structure once this, uh, this muscular tension is softened. Yeah. And we really want to expand. It's almost like a vocabulary. It's learning a new language. And we want to be able to expand our own and our clients' vocabulary because their experience of life, our experience of life, is, is really limited by, these, by the armoring, by these patterns that we're in. So when we're able to let go of these previously held patterns, uh, we really change our experience of life. And so a, f a few notes of, of caution I wanted to put in here, that we don't want to approach people as a character type. We're all unique individuals, and we have these histories of traumas, and the character type is a, is a defense. It's not actually who we are. And, but seeing the character type helps us see what the deeper problems may be and help us free ourselves from the limitations that were put on by our earlier life experience, like that suit of armor I talked about earlier that we put on when we were three years old or five years old. And as we've gone over a little bit here, each type has a special pattern of defense, both psychological and muscular and the energetic level. Again, these are defense positions, not who the people are. And as Gitan mentioned earlier, nobody is a pure type. Everyone, we combine in different degrees, some or all of these patterns. And particularly when we're in certain types of stressors, you know, work stress or relationship stress or family stress, we oftentimes will go into one form of pattern or another to, to deal with this stress. So, um, Gitan, is there anything that you want? I'm sorry, just scoot, scoot ahead on the slide. Is there anything you wanted to add there to that? You expressed it so beautifully. And uh, I think what, uh, what, what I would like to add is that all of these characters are people can come out of them. It's not, I, I, even though we, we learn uh, these things for our protection, we learn all of these strategies so we can try to fit into the world. We create this artificial womb, artificial protection for ourselves. It doesn't have to be set for life. And when the character starts to drop, there's another character possibly that can be underneath that was deeper, and, and longer there that was uh, kind of hidden that can start to come up to the surface. So it's kind of like peeling an onion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, the work with the breath, the work with the body, this really peels this onion to go deep, deep down to the core. Yeah. But it's great to educate yourself so you know uh, what are predominant traces of wolf, which character, where do you belong? So you can actually use this in your advantage. So you can use this as a, as a map, as, as, a, as a path for you, so you can go deeper in knowing yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, there's a lot of, there's a sense of safety in the pattern, but gosh, it's taken up a whole lot of life force energy. It's exhausting to hold, hold these patterns in place. Yes. Energy that could be used for other things for meditation, for dance, for sexuality, for, for connection. It's actually allowing the heart to reach out and be met in this reaching out. The connection, connection and intimacy, which we all want in life. Yeah, yeah. So we have, um, through the BBTR training, we have two webinars, um, full-length webinars, 
that we have um, recorded and uh, developed and recorded to help deepen the theoretical knowledge of this material. The first one is understanding trauma, and that's a four and a half hour webinar that goes through what actually is trauma on the body level, on the emotional level, on the site, on the on the uh, brain system, and our in our um, the anatomy and physiology of the brain, uh, developmental trauma as well as shock trauma. And that gives a lot of insight and understanding as to why people experience what they experience due to trauma, what happens in the body, why, how the body actually changes and what's going on. And then we have a six-hour webinar that goes much more in-depth into the character structure material and developmental trauma. And that goes much more in-depth into each character type, how they're holding the energy in the body, what's actually going on, um, and what needs to be done to work with the care, to, to help loosen up and open up the armoring that the tensions, the multiple layers of tension in the body, the belts of tension Kiten mentioned earlier, um, and what some of the core pitfalls could be in working with each type and what you need to know um, to work with each type. So those are uh, rec webinars that are pre-recorded and they can be purchased and downloaded instantly at the store and there's the website for the store. And then we're having a new training that Gitan and I are doing um, in May, at the end of May in Poland, that we're very excited about. And it's going to be exploring all new ways of working with the character structure from a non-cathartic perspective. Um, it's going to be things that anybody can apply. Not necessarily, you don't have to be a breath worker or a breath therapist. It's for yoga teachers, coaches, therapists of all sorts. And it's going to be looking at uh, what are the ways that we can gently open up the armor, restore the felt sense, um, work with grounding and centering and restoring different bodily capacities that are lost in developmental trauma and what needs to be done to come out of these structures. And those of you who are in the in the biodynamic breath work and trauma release training and the familiar with biodynamic breath work this is going to be a very different type of workshop it's not going to be all breath oriented of course there will be some breath work but it's going to be a lot of information and exercises that we will see what exercises what activation of, of particular muscle groups and how to work with them to for for specific different characters yeah it's highly experiential it's it's not going to be much theory at all in fact the, the two webinars i just spoke about are prerequisites for this group because we really want to take the theoretical knowledge in those two webinars and bring it into real life practice okay here's what we're actually going to do with our clients and we're also going to experience it obviously ourselves and start to really get to see what are our patterns here and what do we need to do and, and healing a lot of that work within ourselves as well yeah anything else Gitan, you'd like to add um no that's pretty uh, straightforward what you just said Prama. I, I think it's it's pretty pretty evident okay well thank you everyone is there any other questions now that we've gone through this webinar please type them in the chat box we have a few minutes left we're almost right on time actually um any other last questions that you have about the character structures or anything that we've talked about today we, we would be very happy to answer somebody's asking if we will be offering somewhere in North America this course uh, we don't have it planned yet but if there's an interest for sure it will be offered mm -hmm. possibly uh, either 2019 or 2020 yeah I can't actually for some oh there's a chat box okay I couldn't see it there wonderful well, thank you everyone for coming on today and being with us. We, we appreciate it and enjoyed being able to share this information with you. We love this work. Um, yeah. It's thank you everyone. And uh, if, if any of you want to sign up for uh, May 27 to June 1, and you can sign up for Biodynamic Breathwork and Trauma Release Training, which happens two days after. If you sign up for both of these workshops together, you will receive 150 euros discount. And we'd love to see you. And Prema is an amazing facilitator. It's such an honor to be presenting together with her this amazing work. And I'm so looking forward to it. 
Thank you. And Gitan, I'm so happy to be here doing this work with you. Uh, we both have this big passion for it. So it's great to be able to put our energies together and to create something that's going to be entirely new. This workshop in Poland is going to be entirely new. So very excited. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Right. Have a beautiful day. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you soon. Ciao. Ciao.